Well, uh, good to have you back as we continue with our 21st sermon in our Hebrews 11 series and our sixth installment in our message on Noah, which is based on Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, that reminds us that by faith, Noah being divinely one of things yet to come, you know, God instructed him to build the ark. And, you know, last week we spoke about Noah's grandfather. And Noah's grandfather, Methuselah, his name is quite uh, significant and important because his name meant that his death shall bring judgment. And we saw that happening uh, when he died. And after he died, the flood came and you know, we thank God that he made the provision in Noah when he, Noah's father Lamech named him Noah, which said that this one shall bring us rest and comfort. You know, Genesis 5.29 highlighted that, that in God's judgment, he had already made the provision for salvation, which came through Noah. As we know, Noah's name meant rest. And, you know, last week I highlighted the importance that the ark had no rudder sails or oars and you know we find that we were in awe <laughs> that it had no oars and rudders and, and a sail because that was quite important because we know that you know a rudder gives us direction it allows us to steer and the sails and the oars you know they give us the power to get it going so when god you know in his blueprint to noah to build the ark when he did not put that in it was quite important because he would give noah direction he would guide the ark and more importantly, that he would control that. And that's what we learned last week, that above all, control of the situation was in God's hand. And when Noah and his family went onto the ark, you know, they surrendered control to God. And we need to know that, you know, before Noah had to get onto the ark, God gave him an invitation. And the invitation was to come. We saw that in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, that God told Noah to come. You know, and as we, we learned in our worship, when, when Jolene led in worship, she mentioned that the first time that the word grace appeared in the Bible was in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, but Noah found grace in God's eyes. And of note is that the first time the word come, the invitation uh, in the Bible was in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, when God said to Noah and his household, come in, to the ark and that's the invitation that God gave and I think you know similar with Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight, where Jesus gave the the same invitation come to me all those heavy laden and burdened and I will give you rest and I think of uh, of note and what we need to uh, remember there is that you know God did not say to Noah go into the ark but he said come into the ark and that's quite important to note because you know, unlike Abraham, God said to Abraham, go uh, and I, to where I was sending you. With Noah, God said to him to come into the ark. And that highlights that God was calling him into his presence. So we know that in the ark was God's presence, that God was there to call Noah. And that's so important to note that, you know, with the ark being a type of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, where like Jesus saves us through uh, his grace, so is the ark, that vessel of God's salvation and God's uh, saving grace that Noah could come. And in that ark was God's presence. And that's what is so important. But you know, in highlighting and going into today's uh, message, we find that before Noah could enter into the ark, he had to meet a condition. And this is the condition that I want to speak about today, because when we look at the name uh, of uh, or the Hebrew word for ark, it means teba. Teba is the Hebrew word for ark. And you know we've seen it when we spoke about pitch, when God asked Noah to, to pitch uh, the ark inside and outside. We realized that it was a play on words because that same word was the word that God had used for atonement, to cover. And similarly, we find that, you know, God being a wordsmith, where in John 1, 1, he goes on to say that in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word, you know, was with us. And, and that's important because, you know, God uses words 
to reveal his spirit, to reveal his intentions. And, and in this word, uh, tiba, which is the word for ark, we find that it is an interchangeable word that was also used to signify a box or a casket. So that was the interchangeable use for that word tiba. But there was another use for the word tiba or another object that it was used to define. And that was a coffin. Why was that significant? Because when God called Noah to build the ark, he was asking him to build a coffin. When God was calling Noah to come into the ark, he was calling him into the coffin. Now you will note that people that are alive don't use a coffin. They don't go into coffins. Only people that are dead. And this is the condition that Noah had to meet before God called him into the ark. Noah had to die. He had to die to himself. And you know, when we look at that, we find that Noah's age at the time of entering the ark was 600 years old. Genesis 7, 6 tells us that. And what's significant about that is that as we spoke about words, you know, God uses numbers to convey hidden messages sometimes. And, you know, it's, it's a study of numerology. And we find that the number six reveals and speaks about the flesh. It's the number of man. And at that time, God was going to destroy all of mankind. All the flesh was going to die except Noah and those that were with him, the animals in the ark. And we find that, you know, the verse that we're going to read today, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 13 to 14. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence to them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, cover it inside and outside with pitch. Speaks about Noah understanding what God said to him. And God said to him in Genesis 6.13, that the end of all flesh has come before me. The earth is filled with sin and I will destroy them. Genesis 6.13. And that's the verses that I've asked uh, Zipporah to read. Verses uh, 13 and 14. And in verse 13, God is clear that the end of all flesh and that's what the number six symbolized, that the end of all flesh was at hand. So when, when Noah entered at the ark at the age of 600 years old, that was the end of all flesh. And that was the end of the old world. Because before Noah stepped onto the ark, the coffin, he surrendered to God by dying to the world. And that's what Noah was able to do. He was able to die to the world. When, when God had called him to build the ark, he had to die to the world. He had to die to the ridicule, the mocking, and all of that. He was dead to the world. And God is calling us similarly, that when we come to Christ, we've got to die to the things of the world. And Noah was able to have a new beginning when he stepped onto the ark to say goodbye to the old world that was going to pass away by the floodwaters. And, and we see that in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, where Paul says that for those of us that are in Christ, we are new creations. We are new creatures. The old has passed away. Behold, everything becomes new. And that's why I've entitled today's message, Dying to Self. Because this is so important for us as believers. And why so many so-called Christians don't go further into Christ. Because they don't die to themselves. And I was so blessed that in my early Christian walk, I was surrounded by mature Christians that taught me the importance of dying to self and how when God calls us, the more we get to Christ, the more we have to die to ourselves. And, and this is why by living more like Christ and denying ourselves, we can get closer to God. And that's the only way. You know, Paul said it in Galatians 2.20. He said, no longer I that live it, but Christ that lived in me. And before that, in the New Living Translation, he says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. Why? Because dying to self makes room for the Holy Spirit. And we can't get closer to God. We can't enter God's presence as much as we'd want to if we do not die to ourselves. And receiving grace comes by dying to the flesh. Because Jesus said it very clearly. God says, no flesh shall glory in his presence. So to get closer to God, to get into God's kingdom like Noah, Noah had to die to the things of the world before he could enter into the ark, which, as we've learned, was a play on words that could have meant coffin. 
And dead people are the only people that go into a coffin. And we, we see a paradox in this. Because in Christ, the key to living is dying. But stay with me as I unpack that a bit further in our message, Dying to Self. Because in Christ, for us that are followers of Jesus Christ, the way to life is death. We can see this flesh wants a lot of things. This flesh wants attention. This flesh wants glory. But even as John the Baptist said that I may decrease, that he may increase. And that should be our prayer. Lord, fill me. Lord, in the song that we sang, the beautiful hymn, I surrender, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. And that comes by living that crucified life like Jesus did. You know, in John 12, 24, Jesus says, unless a grain falls to the ground and dies, it abideth alone. And unless it dies, then only can it produce much grain. And that's an agricultural message that I'm sure farmers will know very well, that the seed has to die. It has to get really to that stage where you think there's nothing in it. But when it's thrown into the ground and it's sowed, the life comes from that seed and it produces many, many, many more than what was in it. So it's important to remember, and that verse is so powerful to me because, you know, when I wrote my book, Born a Hindu, Die a Hindu, which was the words that my mother spoke to me when I came home and I told her I'm now a Christian, I'm no longer a Hindu. You know, she wasn't a happy chap. She pointed a finger in my face and she said, you're born a Hindu, you die a Hindu. But, you know, the reality is that when I wrote that book, the day that I wrote the book, I got the news that my mom had passed away. And I dedicated that book to my mom's uh, honor, because, you know, she became a Christian, as I mentioned, uh, six years after I became a Christian in 94, she became a Christian in 2000. And, and the book, when I got the news that she had died, you know, she hadn't read the book. She had heard of it, but she hadn't read it. And, and immediately the Lord gave me this verse, John 12, 24, that unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. And from that, you know, with the book, there's been countless, countless testimonies and feedback from people that have given their hearts to the Lord or friends that they had given the book to had given their hearts to the Lord. And, and that's where I, I want to use that as an analogy, that when my mother dying, it was it, her testimony brought life. And similarly, you know, Jesus calls us in the cross. The cross was a symbol of death to the world at the time. That was what was significant. And to a Christian, the cross is a symbol of death to self and total surrender. Because to someone at that time, to a Christian, uh, to a, anybody living at the time, even if you were not a Christian, they knew that what the cross symbolized. The cross symbolizes death. Now, this is what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38 to 39. He says, and he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What is Jesus saying? The message of the cross is dying to self. If you do not die to self, you cannot please God. And this is what he's saying, that he who finds his life will lose it. But he who loses his life, he who gives his life to Jesus will regain it. And that's what Jesus is speaking about. He's speaking about the resurrection. He's speaking about the time when we're going to see him. And that message is so symbolic as we look at the ark.